Okay, let me share the screen. Is the presentation visible to uh, to all of you? Yes. Thank you. So we'll start with the Shanti Mantra and then begin the class. Om Purna Madaha Purna Midam Purna Purna Mudachate Purna Sya Purnam Adaya Purnam Eva Avashishate Om Shanti 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 Thank you. Welcome to the course CCN 534 Antenna Theory and Design. So in the previous lectures, what we have seen uh, is wire antenna, right? We use, we saw what dipole antenna is, how to analyze the dipole antenna. One of the categories of wire antenna was dipole antenna. Uh, so we saw how to analyze the dipole antenna. Why should we study the dipole antenna in the first place? Uh, how to analyze the dipole antenna using, using analytical uh, methods? and analytical technique and uh, how to analyze the uh, dipole antenna using simulation using cst simulation to be very specific okay so any clarifications you need in the previous lectures or it was clear to all of you we spent some sufficient time there because it's, it's a very important antenna so that's why i wanted to give some time over there i think it is clear to all of you please practice the simulation part at your end both the dipole, monopole, PCB monopole, anyway, it's a part of the assignment. So please practice all of this and um, be thorough with it. Okay, in today's lecture, what we'll cover is another category of wire antenna known as loop antenna. So loop antenna, as the name says, it's, it's an antenna uh, which looks like a loop. And there used to be a lot of applications for loop antennas back then, but uh, nowadays there is only one application, only one application where it is limited to. So I will not spend much time on loop antennas. I will try to cover it today itself. We will just go through basics of the loop antenna and then we will uh, we will skip all the uh, the hard part and we will try to understand how to analyze the loop antennas from a simpler perspective. OK, so the flow of this presentation will be as follows. I will start with the motivation. Why should we study loop antennas? There is not much motivation, but there are some important applications. So we have to see what are those applications are. And then we will look into a small circular loop antenna as we did in the case of dipole antennas. Uh, dipole antenna infinite. We started the analysis of dipole antenna with infinitely small dipole antenna, right? To make our life simple. Similarly, we will consider very small circular loop antennas and we will try to analyze a very small circular loop antennas. And then we will uh, just have a brief look at the circular loop antenna with constant current and uh, circular loop antenna with non-uniform current. See, circular loop antennas, finite size circular loop antennas with constant current is an approximation. It is not practically, uh, it's not practically possible to have constant current and still have finite loop antennas. So what is more practical is circular loop antennas, finite size circular loop antennas with non-uniform current. But the analysis is so complicated that it is very often relied on simulation or experimentation. So just please hold on a minute. Yeah, sorry for the disturbance. Let me. So in all the three categories, uh, this infinitely small circular loop antenna is a hypothetical antenna, which is used only for analysis, trying to, which is which is a helpful tool to understand how to perform analysis for loop antennas, which is not practically possible. Circular loop antennas with constant current is once again a gross approximation, which is not practically possible either. So circular loop antennas with non-uniform current is more practical, it's more close to the empirical possibility that happens in real life but the analysis is so complicated that we will not be looking into the analysis we will just see the radiation patterns and then move on okay so why should we study loop antennas so one of the important applications of loop antennas at present is rfid applications whereas in rfid applications it is used not used in the far field it is used in the near field so we need to know how to analyze the loop antennas in the near field also uh, so this is the near field loop antenna. This is from HT Microelectronics. They have printed it on a PCB. They also have uh, some kind of a matching or some kind of uh, some matching component along in, placed in series with the antenna. Uh, 
this is a PCB we lay out. So the name it, it looks like a loop and it is generally used for near field coupling. So other than RFID applications, I don't I have not found uh, any loop antennas widely used in other applications. There used to be time when loop antennas were used in form of spirals for uh, TV broadcasting. But then Yaguda came and took over it. And nowadays parabolic dish antennas have taken over the antenna in broadcast TV broadcasting uh, at the reception side. So we will focus loop antennas for both for near field and the far field because it is widely used in the RFID applications. So that's why we, let us have a look at loop antennas and see how to analyze the loop antennas. So we, then we go into a small circular loop antennas. So once again, the small circular loop antennas is an hypothetical antenna, which is helpful only for the analysis perspective. So how do we analyze the loop antenna? So this is how we start, right? So we need auxiliary vector potential. So once we know auxiliary vector potential, we can then calculate the magnetic field and electric field using the del cross and del dot, right? So the first step is to find out the auxiliary vector potential. So for auxiliary vector potential, we need to integrate the current distribution on the antenna and the space factor over the length of the antenna. So we have to integrate the current distribution and the space factor over the length of the antenna. And uh, so let us, there are two important things to note down here. One is the space factor. The second fact, second thing is the uh, current distribution. So let us start with the space factor. It is very important to note that what do you mean by R? R is the distance from any point on the current source to the observation point. So let us take geometry and try to understand what exactly do we mean by that. Okay, so let the antenna be placed in the XY plane. So this is a circular loop. So this is where the antenna is placed. It is placed in the XY plane and the center of the antenna coincides with the origin. Forget about this arrow mark. There is no arrow mark like this. Okay, so just forget about this arrow mark. So the center of the antenna coincides with the origin and the antenna is placed in the XY plane. And if you take any small element of antenna, the antenna radius is A. Okay, so the radius of the antenna, it's a circular loop. So the radius of the antenna is A and just hold on a minute, I'm just taking a minute seconds. Yeah. Okay, so the radius of the antenna is A and uh, so the distance from the origin to the observation point. So observation point is XYZ. So observation point can be anywhere on the 3D space. So that is x, y, z denoted by x, y, z. The element on the antenna is denoted as x dash, y dash, z dash, right? So that's the element of antenna. And the x dash, y dash, z dash keeps changing as we move along the antenna. x, y, z is observation point. Now in the spherical coordinate system, we have small r is a distance from the observation point to the origin, not on the point of the antenna, to the origin. That's a small r. It is independent on the point of the antenna. Wherever we are on the antenna, small r remains the same. Theta and phi are the spherical coordinate system for the observation point. Whereas, whereas now uh, we have theta dash and phi dash is the observation point on is the spherical coordinate system for the point on the antenna. Okay, and theta dash is 90 degree because we are in the x y plane. So theta dash is 90 degree. It's clear to all of you this. So the element on the antenna is given by DL. That's an element on the antenna, element of length on the antenna. So that is nothing but your A D theta. So this is coming from S is equal to R theta, right? So A D phi. A D phi is the element, unit, uh, is the element of length on the antenna. So this is a geometry. Remember this capital R is the distance from the observation point to the point on the antenna. So if we keep moving along the point of the along the antenna, capital R is going to change. Whereas smaller is not going to change. Smaller is from the origin. So smaller remains constant. Whereas capital R is going to change as we move along the antenna. So in the auxiliary vector potential, we have to determine what is capital R. Okay. So let us go with the uh, basic geometry and try to determine what is express capital R in terms of small r and radius and see how how we can simplify capital R in terms of small r. 
So first thing is to express uh, the exact expression for the capital R. So the capital R is the distance. So it is a, it basically this expression is nothing but the distance, right? Between x, y, z and x dash, y dash, z dash. Remember x dash, y dash, z dash is going to change as we move along the antenna. As we integrate DL, as we integrate along the contour of the antenna, so your DL is going to change, your x dash, y dash, z dash is also going to change. Okay, not your DL, uh, uh, your X dash Y dash, the dash is going to change. So the capital R is given by the distance between X, Y, Z and X dash, Y dash, the dash. Express that in terms of spherical coordinate system. This is nothing but expressing expressing the rectangular coordinate system in spherical coordinate system. X square, Y square, Z square is uh, summation of that is R square, small R square. And uh, similarly, x dash y dash the dash can also be expressed in terms of spherical coordinate system. Remember, theta is 90 degree. Why theta dash is 90 degree? Because we are in the x y plane. So theta dash is 90 degree. So uh, and z dash is also zero because we are in the uh, we are at, we are we are in the x y plane. So the z dash is zero. So we have the expression for uh, x y z and x dash y dash the dash in terms of spherical coordinate system. Okay. So if you simplify this and if you plug this uh, spherical coordinate system into this expression, the expression simplifies to this form. So this is uh, the simplified expression for capital R. In terms of small r, a, a is the radius of the loop, small r a, and theta is the observation. Theta is the uh, spherical coordinate system for the observation point. Phi is the spherical coordinate system for the observation point. Phi dash is the spherical coordinate system on the for the element of length on the antenna. So as we move along the length of the antenna, the phi dash is going to change. The rest of the parameters are not going to change. Theta is remains same, phi remains same, whereas phi dash is going to change. So phi dash is a function. So this is going to change. R is not going to change, A is not going to change. What is DL? DL we have already seen AD5. DL element that element of length on the antenna is nothing but AD5. D5 is going is a uh, is we have to integrate it with respect to D5, D5 dash. Okay, so that was the space coordinates space factor. So space factor we have expressed it. Uh, we have tried to simplify the space factor and we got the space factor. So let us now look into what is the expression for current. So what is the distribution of current along the antenna? So the current is slightly more complicated. So the complication comes from the geometry. See the current, what are the, suppose, which is the best geometry we can use for current distribution? Can anybody tell me? Is it rectangular coordinate system should be used or spherical coordinate system or is it a cylindrical coordinate system for current components? Look at the current, it is in the phi right so the current we have the current only in the phi direction in the dipole antenna we had only in the z direction that's why we use rectangular coordinate system there and then we transformed it to spherical coordinate system whereas here which which coordinate system is much more convenient because it is there only in the phi and it is cylindric yes exactly so we have to go with cylindrical coordinate system uh, because the current is there only in the phi direction and uh, we don't have any radial component of the current and there is also no z component of the current there is no theta component for the current so we are going to use the cylindrical coordinate system for current components so whatever we have the current distribution in the rectangular coordinate system we express the rectangular coordinate system in terms of cylindrical coordinate system right for the current components but we are interested in the unit vectors have to be in spherical coordinate system because we are interested in theta and phi components eventually e theta e phi e r h theta h phi h r so the unit element the unit vectors are transformed to spherical coordinate system whereas the current components is expressed in terms of cylindrical coordinate system so in the cylindrical coordinate system if you if you express the current distribution in the uh, cylindrical coordinate system for the components and the rectangular co and the unit vectors are in the spherical coordinate system. Note that a rho component is zero. There is no radial component for the current, right? So there is no radial component for the current. There is no z component for the current. So there is only, uh, forget about this arrow mark, there, there is no z component. So there is only theta component. So the theta component, we have only theta component for the current and 
is the sulfide component we only have five component for the current and the current distribution can be expressed uh, as consisting of the radial this in the spherical coordinates unit vectors consisting of only the five component of the current so we now have the current distribution and we now have the space factor so the auxiliary vector potential we are supposed to evaluate is basically consisting of the current current distribution and the space factor right so now we have the current distribution for each component for each unit vector a r a theta a phi and the space factor now the remember in the space factor the we have to integrate it the, we have to integrate the entire uh, integration from over the phi varying phi dash varying from 0 to 2 pi we have to integrate it along the length of the antenna along the contour of the antenna from so phi dash is the only variable that is that needs to be integrated from 0 to 2 pi right phi dash so here all theta and phi are all independent of phi dash so only we have to integrate it with respect to phi dash so this even this we have to evaluate it this is quite challenging to evaluate it but let us take one component and try to evaluate only one of the components and show rest of them how to evaluate it just to have a feel of how to uh, do such evaluation so we will take only the phi component which is much simpler to evaluate so we will take only the a, a phi component and we will show how to evaluate the a phi component so auxiliary vector potential for a phi component consists of the current component current distribution is nothing but i phi cos theta cos phi minus phi dash and the space factor here we make one of the first assumptions so the first assumption is we make constant current so we make uh, the assumption that it is very so small that the loop is so small that the current distribution along the loop is basically constant so that's an important assumption that we make so we similar to what we did in the infinitesimal dipole right so in the infinitesimal dipole also we made a similar assumption we made the assumption that the dipole is so small that the current distribution along the dipole was constant in its magnitude and phase distribution was zero similarly we make the similar assumption that i phi dash that means if you vary along the length along the antenna the current distribution is uniform so the, the loop has to be so small that the current distribution is uniform so that's the first assumption we make so by making that assumption we can remove this current and take it outside the integral integral right because it is constant it is not varying with phi dash anymore it is not varying along the length of the antenna anymore so we can take the current outside the integral. So we made one simplification. So we took the current outside the integral. What are we left out with? So we are left, A is independent. So we can take A also outside the integral. So we are left out with cos phi dash and some scary looking function of, so it's a very scary looking function. But it is not that uh, difficult. As we will see, we can evaluate such functions. So there is no approximation yet made in this function. So this is the integral that we are supposed to evaluate it. Cos phi dash function of A is uh, radius of the loop d phi dash. So we have to evaluate this function, where function is uh, function is uh, f of A is given by this expression. Here, remember that theta, we only have phi dash. So theta is independent of the phi dash. Theta depends only on the observation point. Okay, so this is the same slide. So we have to evaluate the A phi integral, A phi, which has an integral of cos phi and cos phi dash and f of A d phi dash. f of A is this expression. Okay, so now we make some approximations. Now, once again, we bring the approximation that if A is very small, okay, if A is very small, tending to zero. Now we make even more strong approximation that A tends to zero. So then what happens? So if you make that approximation, we can use the Maclaurin series where f of a at a is equal to zero, wherever when the a tends to zero, then it can be expressed as f of a of zero, f of a of first derivative of f of a at a equal to zero into a and rest higher derivatives. We are not interested in higher derivatives. So let us focus on the first two components of that. So f of a at a equal to zero, basically can be equated to f of a of 0 plus first derivative of f of a at a equal to 0 into a. Okay, so this is Maclaurin series expansion assuming at a equal to 0. That means we are making the loop extremely small, tiny bit of a loop. So in that case, what happens we will see. 
what is f of a equal to zero? f of a equal to zero is in this expression, go and place wherever a is zero. So a is zero, 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 zero cancels. So square root of r square is only, only remaining. So e power of minus jk r by r. So that is a function for f of a equal to zero. And then you take the derivative of this using the division rule. Take the derivative. That's much more little bit harder to work. But if you take the derivative and then place a equal to zero, you will end up with this expression. Okay, so this is the derivative of f of a. So basically take the derivative of first derivative of f of a using the division rule and then place a equal to zero after taking the derivative. So you will end up with this expression. Okay, so this is the first derivative of f of a at a equal to zero and into multiplied with a. So that is our expression for f of a at a equal to zero. So we have evaluated the f of a equal to zero. So basically f of a at f of a at a equal to zero, we have evaluated in the in form in the closed form expression. Okay. So now what we have is we have a phi is equal to integral of cos phi dash into f of a function at a equal to zero, applicable only for small loops. Now this 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 equation is applicable only for small loops. So it's explicitly mentioned here. And how do we evaluate this integral? This integral is very simple. Now, it looks a little bit lengthy, but it's very simple. So let us try to evaluate this integral. So let us take the first term. So the cos phi dash into one by r, right? Cos phi, cos phi dash into one by r with respect to d phi dash, cos uh, with respect to d phi dash, we're integrating it. So what happens is cos phi dash will be minus sine phi dash, right? So minus sine phi dash in the limit zero to two pi will be zero because it is r is independent so you can take it r outside the integral so you're left out with minus sine phi dash limit 0 to 2 pi is 0 so this term goes away so this term is no longer there a you can take it outside so a you can take it outside that becomes c square and then we are left out with this function this function also is independent of phi dash so you can take this outside so you have a factor there e power of minus jkr is independent of phi dash so you can take that outside sin theta you can take it outside it is independent of phi dash sin theta depends on observation point remember not on the point on the antenna so we are left out with once again cos phi dash okay so we are left out with cos phi dash uh, we cos phi dash integrating it from 0 to 2 pi right so how do we do on cos phi dash cos phi square dash because we have to multiply with cos into cos here so cos square phi cos phi dash the square of cos phi dash integrating with respect to d phi so that you can express it as 1 by 2 plus 1 cos 2 pi right so you can express it as 1 by 2 plus cos for cos square basically the cos square formula is 1 plus cos 2 theta by 2 so in that way, so let me put here, let me even confirm myself. Yeah, so we have cos square theta. Cos square theta is one plus cos two theta by two. So cos two theta, so we have two terms, one by two and cos two theta by two here. So we have one by two and cos two theta by two in this particular expression. So cos 2 theta once again integral of cos 2 theta is minus sine 2 theta and sine 2 theta 0 to 2 pi once again will get cancelled. So because we are integrating sine right in the limits, we are integrating cos in the limits of 0 to 2 pi, cos 2 theta goes, goes away. So we are left out with only 1 by 2. So 1 by 2 d phi dash. So 1 by 2 d phi dash if you integrate it from 0 to 2 pi, it is 2 pi. So 2 pi by 2, we are left with pi. Pi pi cancels here. So we are left with pi, pi pi cancels. So this is what the overall integration is. So we try to do this integration. This is simpler. So this is much simpler compared to other integrations. So you try, please try to do this integration. So this integration, if you solve it, you get this expression. Remember, this expression is applicable only for small loops, only when a is equal to zero. Okay. Okay, so we have seen the a phi component. Then we have the AR, AR component and A theta component. And if you do the integral, so once again, you have to do the same thing. You know f of A at A equal to zero, which is this expression. Take that expression and plug into the space factor and multiply the current distribution. Whatever is the component which is independent of phi dash, take it outside. 
like make the current constant assumption and uh, take the component sine theta cos theta outside the integral because they are independent of phi dash. And now if you integrate into find the integral of this, this turns out to be zero. So you can show that this turns out to be zero. It's much more harder. It's not obvious. This was much more obvious. Just by looking at this expression, we can evaluate the integral integration of that. Whereas this is much more a uh, little bit harder. So you, you just have to evaluate it. If, if possible, please try to evaluate this. So you can show that AR component is zero and A theta component is zero. So you're left out with only A phi component. That's why we took only A phi component to start with. So if we had taken AR component, we would have done a lot of maths and show that it is zero. And then we would have take A theta component, show a lot of maths and show it's zero. And finally, we have to go for A phi component. So we are left out with only A phi component. So the A phi component is given by this expression. Okay, now it is very clear to us. So what would we do? We got the current expression. We made some simplifications in the current expression. Uh, we made some simplification in the space factor. We used the assumption that the loop is very small for both the simplifications. And in that case, we got, uh, so we got uh, an expression for current uh, auxiliary vector potential. And the auxiliary vector potential, what we are supposed to do now is to calculate the electric in the magnetic field. So how do we calculate the magnetic field? The magnetic field is given by the curl of, in the spherical coordinate system. Remember it in the spherical coordinate system. So the curl of A. And the electric field is given by this expression that includes the divergence, once again, in the spherical coordinate system. So if we evaluate that, we get expression for HR, H theta, H phi and ER, E theta, E phi. But can anybody say, can anybody see this observation and make some observation? Can, you, can anybody see the expressions and make some observations with respect to dipole antenna, the infinitesimal dipole antenna? Do you remember? Vaguely something. Some interesting observation. Let me let me try to tell. So in the uh, dipole antenna, what happened was ER E theta existed, okay, and he phi was zero, whereas HR H theta was zero and H phi existed. So this looks like a dual of dipole antenna. So uh, these expressions look almost, and there were uh, these expressions are also were of similar nature. So this looks like a dual of dipole antenna. The expressions look like to the first hand, it looks like a dual for a dual of dipole antenna. At least the component wise, which component exists and which component don't exist. Okay. So for the small loop, we have now the near field and the far field expressions. So we have uh, the near field and the far field expressions for electric and magnetic fields. So what is the next step? Once we have the magnetic and electric fields, Pointing vector, power density. Power density, yes, pointing vector, power density. So the next step is to go to the power density and uh, calculate the pointing vector. Uh, e cross H conjugate. So we already have the, it's very similar, similar to what we did in the dipole antenna. So we have the magnetic and electric field intensities. So plug in those expressions and then evaluate the unit vectors and the expression for the uh, pointing vector. So the pointing vector once again consists of the radial component and the theta component. So what are those components? Let us see. So the radial component consists of very interesting, very much similar. We have the real part with function of sine square. Even there we had function of sine square, right? In the radial, in the real, in the radial component of the real part. So we have the function depending on sine square. Infinity of dipole antenna also had sine square theta. So we have identical pattern shape shape of the pattern is identical not the scaling factor just the shape and then there is an imaginary part also whereas the theta component is purely imaginary so there is no real part there is purely imaginary and it is varying as a function of r power five there also it was varying as a function of r power five here also the imaginary part is varying as a function of r power five whereas the real part is varying as r square as it should vary so what we can make a uh, conclusion is that the imaginary part corresponds to the pulsating power and uh, which is needed in case of near field applications. Whereas for the far field applications or in the far field, uh, we can focus only on the real part. 
So what is the next step once we have the real, what is once you have the power density? The next obvious step is to radiation resistance. How do we get the radiation resistance? We calculate the P radiated, sir. P radiated, perfect. So the next obvious step is to calculate the P radiated, that is the radiated power. So because we know the power density, so we integrate the power density over the entire spherical region with only the radial component and we retain only the real part of it. So if you integrate the power density over the entire sphere, spherical region with only the radial component because we are interested in only the outgoing power, right? Not the pulsating power. So we we and retain only the real part of it. So don't take the imaginary part, just retain the real part of it and integrate it with respect to 0 to pi d theta and uh, 0 to 2 pi d phi. So d phi becomes 2 pi. You can take the 2 pi outside and uh, sine theta d theta is what you have to evaluate. So if you evaluate that and uh, over the limits, what you get is a p radiated. So p radiated, you, you can find the p radiated. And now as uh, one of the student informed us, the next step is to go for radiation resistance. We know the P radiated. So let us go for radiation resistance. P radiated we have in terms of current, which is nothing but half I square R, I square I square cancels. So we can calculate the radiation resistance. Radiation resistance is given by this expression. Can anybody tell me what is K here? What is K? Phase constant. Phase constant. It's a propagation constant. Phase constant. Yes. 2 pi by lambda, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So we have the radiation resistance. So the radiation resistance is, can be expressed in terms of circumference or the area. Pi A square is area and C is a 2 pi A is a circumference. So we have the radiation resistance expression. Uh, in terms of radius also. Okay, so it can be shown. So, so right now we have done the analysis only for a single loop. So if you take n terms, n loops, uh, you can show that the radiation resistance is uh, gets multiplied by a factor of n square. So it goes, it becomes a factor of n square comes into picture if we have n terms. It's much more complicated to show and it is an approximate expression, which is not exact real expression. So if we have n small loops, uh, then we can show that the uh, radiation resistance becomes n square. Okay, so the next step is to calculate the directivity. So for that, we need radiation intensity to start with. So the radiation intensity is given by R square into radiation power density. So we already have the expression for radiation power density, only the real part of it I'm taking and I uh, multiply it by R square, so I get the expression for radiation intensity. Once again, remember, look at the similarity. We have sine square theta as the pattern, shape of the pattern is sine square theta power pattern, and the shape of the dipole power pattern was also sine square theta. What was the approximate uh, shape of the dipole antenna for the dipole power pattern for the dipole antenna? Dumbbell shapes. Sorry? Dumbbell shapes. Correct. What was the approximate expression for that, for the half wavelength dipole antenna? For the half wavelength. It was sine cube theta, right? So for the infinitesimal dipole antenna, it was sine square theta. For the half wavelength dipole antenna, it is sine cube theta, approximate expressions. And uh, so here it is sine square theta, very much, very much similar to what we had in the dumbbell shaped. Uh, as well, what we had in the uh, infinitesimal dipole antenna. So once we have the radiation power density, we can easily calculate the directivity. So directivity is U maximum by P radiated. We know P radiated, we have already evaluated P radiated. We know U maximum and U maximum occurs at theta equal to pi by two. Uh, so we have the directivity as three by two, exactly identical to the uh, infinitesimal dipole antenna. There also it was 3 by 2, 1.5. Here also we get 1.5. And once we know directivity, the maximum effective aperture area is given by lambda squared by 4 pi into d naught, which is once again 0.12. Or this is 0.12, I think, 0.12 lambda square. 
Okay, so we have we come to know how to evaluate. We have come to know how to evaluate how to do theoretical analysis for infant principal dipole antenna. So we have uh, calculated radiation resistance, directivity, and effective aperture area uh, in not infant principal dipole antenna, small loop antennas. So for the small loop antenna, one of the important uh, assumption we made that it was extremely small. So A tends to zero. So that was the approximation we have made. So all these values are applicable only when A tends to zero. So, but when A tends to zero, there's no antenna at all, right? So this is just for the sake of doing the analysis and just for the sake of trying to understand what are the steps needed for doing the analysis. Okay. So let us take one simple example, uh, some uh, very basic example, and try to understand what are the challenges and what what are the how how is it difficult how is it different from the uh, infant cell dipole antenna. Find the radiation resistance of a single turn and an eight turn small circular loop antenna. Uh, the radius of the loop is given by lambda by twenty five, so it's quite small lambda by twenty five, and the medium is free space. So whatever we did the analysis, we can take here and plug in the values because this is quite small. So we calculate the we know the radius radius is given. So we express the radius in terms of lambda. OK, so radius is given in terms of lambda, so we can calculate the surface area of the same, which is given by this expression. And for the single turn, we know so this is for the single turn, right? So, so for the single turn, if you plug in the values, you get 0.8 ohm. So it is extremely, so it's very small. So the radiation distance is so small that it's very difficult to do the matching with a single turn. So what happens if we use 8 turns? So with the 8 turns, the expression becomes 8 square. So we multiply the radiation resistance by 8 square. So it's close to 50 ohm, right? So now the matching is not that difficult. But how do you make 8 turns and still make the radius 0 is much more challenging. But it is unlike the infinitesimal dipole antenna, the radiation resistance is close to 50 ohm because we have one more parameter at our hand now, which is the number of turns, number of loops, number of turns in the loop. Okay, so what is the observation? So the observation was to increase the radiation efficiency, the multi turns is often employed. So that's why if you try it sometime, if you have an RFID card which is not working, or you, you can buy an RFID card and try to open it up and see. Whether there is one turn or how many turns it has, what is the loop radius and what frequency it is operating at. So those things will be interesting. So you can open any of these RFID cards and see uh, the number of turns in the RFID card. So it will be generally multi turns. I think it will be multi turns. It won't be a single loop. Most of the time it will be multi turns because it will be easy to do matching. Now this is important. This I got it from the textbook itself. So, however, because the current distribution in a multi-turn loop is quite complex, great confidence has not been placed on analytical placed in analytical methods for determining the radiation efficiency. So, whatever we carried out for a single turn, if we extrapolate it for the eight turns, there will be very much chance that there will be a deviation from the empirical results to what we have done the analytical means. So the great confidence has not been placed because the current distribution is very complex. We simplified the current distribution, right? We told it is uniform because it is very small loop. So we told it the current is uniform and still the analysis was very complicated. It was not as easy as for the dipole antenna. But if we go for multi turn loops, the analysis is very complicated and it's there is the, not just complicated, there is no confidence that the analytical means results we get from analytical means match the empirical efficient empirical methods. So great reliance has been placed on experimental procedures. So my suggestion is if you are working on loop antennas or if you are working on an RFID project, do the simulation in a CST or HFSS and get the radiation parameters from the simulation. So that will be more close to your experimental results. Don't go for analytical means for loop antenna. It is, I have worked out, I have tried it some time back when I was working on wireless mouse. So I was interested because there are some interesting features. I will discuss that of the loop antenna. But I found out that uh, the best way to go for loop antenna analysis is to use the simulation tool. 
that will give you a very clear picture of what is happening and where the radiation pattern is how the radiation patterns are so it will give you a very clear picture what are the matching networks required so those things it will give you okay now if you see if you look at any loop antenna unlike the dipole antenna oh, sorry so unlike the dipole antenna if you see a loop there is a loop right so as soon as there is a loop there is a self inductance that is coming into the picture a strong self inductance significant self inductance that comes into the picture so the loop antenna matching is what we have to look into the next step because there is inductance coming into the picture because of the loop itself so the self inductance is significant so we have to see how to do how to do the matching network a basic very simple matching network for a loop antenna so this is the antenna okay so input impedance of the antenna is shown here so it consists of loss resistance coming because of the losses in the metal it consists of radiation resistance what we have already calculated in one of the example which corresponds to how much of the energy is being radiated and then there are two inductances one is the inductance of the loop itself of the antenna of the big loop what we saw just now and then there is the inductance self inductance of the metal itself of the conductor so we have this if you see the input impedance of the loop antenna it will have a real part and the reactance part positive reactance part right so the best the simplest way to match the loop antenna is to put a parallel capacitance so if you put a parallel capacitance between the two feeding points of, of the loop antenna you can resonate out the loop antenna at the desired frequency so let us calculate how to let us see how to calculate the capacitance value given the input impedance of the loop antenna so the loop antenna input impedance is given by total r in various x in where r in is the summation of radiation resistance and the loss resistance and the, the total reactance part consists of the inductance of the loop itself and the inductive inductive reactance of the conductor of the metal conductor so we know the input impedance of the loop antenna and we have we are supposed to calculate put a, a capacitance in parallel so i will calculate the admittance input the admittance of the loop antenna so input admittance of the loop antenna is nothing but 1 by zn right so 1 by zn is 1 by rn plus 1 by jx in so if you take the conjugate of this then you get the real part which is which is the conductance as rn by rn square plus x in square and the susceptance so the susceptance is given by minus x in by rn square plus so you just take the conjugate of this so if you take the conjugate of this you get the real part which is the conductance and the imaginary part which is the susceptance now we have to place the capacitance uh, the susceptance of the capacitor should be such that it has to cancel out the susceptance of the inductor right so you just omega cr should be equal to minus b in which is x in by r in plus r in square plus x in square so you can calculate the capacitance so if you know the input impedance of the antenna of the loop antenna you can calculate the capacitance that needs to be placed at the feeding points in parallel at the feeding points so that so as to cancel out the reactive part and reactive part coming from the loop and we can do the matching so we will be much easier to do the matching so it, the matching is much more complicated compared to dipole antenna dipole antenna in order to resonate what did we do with the dipole antenna half wavelength dipole antenna to resonate at the required frequency anybody remember we did it during simulation so we we designed at 2.45 gigahertz so it was resonating at 2.2 gigahertz so what did we do to bring it back to 2.45 gigahertz increasing length yes uh, so we trimmed the length basically we trimmed the length right so basically we altered the length just by altering the length of the antenna we can resonate it we can bring the resonance frequency to the desired frequency whereas in the loop antenna you need to place a matching network so that's an additional constraint that happens with the loop antenna so without the capacitance it is very difficult to resonate the antenna at the desired frequency because you will have a, you will have a strong loop uh, self inductance of the loop because it's the loop right so you will have a very strong self uh, inductance so in order to resonate out you need to place a capacitance so that's an additional constraint if you want to do use the loop antennas so there, that's why loop antenna slowly got phased out because there are so many constraints and uh, there are very few applications where it is limited to. 
anyways uh, we can we, we know how to calculate the required capacitance to match the loop antenna given the input impedance of the loop antenna so you can get the input impedance of the loop antenna using any of the cst simulation tools to do right so from the smith chart you can calculate the input impedance so any of the 3d simulation tool you can calculate the input impedance okay so let me see, just have a quick look at the time we still have time okay so what we will do now is this was the analysis of a small circular loop antenna this itself was quite a bit of analysis compared to dipole antenna now we will look into circular loop with constant current and circular loop with non uniform current but i will not go into the analysis analysis is extremely complicated and very often it will not match your empirical results so I, my suggestion is go for simulation and simulation tool and try to model the loop antennas and take the loop antennas if you are supposed to if you are working on rfid or the applications or something try to model the loop antenna using simulation tool vary the parameters and get the desired performance so i will just show you the briefly i will briefly show you the radiation patterns how the radiation patterns of a circular loop antenna finite size circular loop antenna uh, finite size circular loop antenna with constant current okay so if you take the finite size circular loop antenna with constant current so that so if you place the antenna in the xy plane okay so if you're placing the antenna in the xy plane your radiation pattern is once again looks like a donut shape but it is not very simple so the it is not sine square theta or sine cube theta it is much more complicated it is jacobian it will have a coefficients of jacobian coefficients so the size the circumference of the antenna is 0.1 lambda now we are looking at for finite size loop antennas so it's a once again a donut shaped radiation pattern omnidirectional radiation pattern so the antenna is placed in the xy plane okay so the antenna is placed here now if you increase the, the circumference of the antenna so you make a bigger antenna so if you make a bigger antenna now the radiation pattern looks something like this so it has an omnidirectional pattern plus your grating loop starts coming into picture but let me tell you this was for circular loop antennas with constant current this is not the correct approximation because as soon as you make the circular loop antennas finite size current is no longer constant so that is an important assumption that is a that's one of the limitations so if you make even bigger this pattern is not right because you will have non uniform distribution of the current so let us see would let us take one example of circular loop antenna with non uniform current because that is more realistic right because uh, even there some approximations are involved so if you take circular loop antenna with non uniform current even for lambda okay when c is equal to lambda circumference is wavelength is equal to one wavelength that means antenna is placed in the xy plane look at the pattern look the pattern is extremely complicated it is neither omnidirectional nor directional it is more close to a directional pattern uh, it varies as theta varies it varies as phi varies so it's much more complicated this is much more realistic pattern what you will get in a loop antenna it is no longer omnidirectional so if you yes, so I, to, i told i will explain you why i was looking into Uh, loop antennas right the reason i was looking into loop antennas was this reason so if you design a wireless mouse you are use and you place the uh, loop antenna on the plane of pcb so if you place it horizontal your pattern will be omnidirectional in the horizontal plane which is very difficult to get in the dipole so in the dipole you have to place it vertical so if you place it vertical then you will get horizontal omnidirectional pattern whereas in the loop antennas if you place it horizontal you will get horizontal omnidirectional pattern that is very interesting feature if you want to use it for wireless mouse or wireless keyboards so that's why i was exploring loop antennas then but then i found out that as i started doing simulation this assumption is not valid at all this uniform current assumption is not valid at all so the pattern was some becoming something like this which was not serving my purpose so that's why i left it out uh, at the same time it will also require additional matching network significant matching network components will be required there will be additional loss coming from the matching network so it will the radiation efficiency will come down poorer also so this is one of the practical challenges of loop antennas so the pattern will be something like this this is more realistic pattern but i will suggest you if you are working on rfids Pre, uh, may design the loop antenna in an in the simulator tool and then try to do the simulation 3d simulation em simulation 
and then see the pattern. So that's a very clear cut. Uh, that's a very neat way to approach the problem. So analytical means have a lot of limitations when we come to loop antennas. OK, so with that, I would like to conclude today's lecture. So I went a little bit fast, so please go through it once again. So if you have any clarifications, please let me know. So I the, the takeaway from today's lecture is how you should know how to analyze the loop antennas, at least small circular loop antennas. What are the steps involved? How to make the approximations on the current? What are the approximations on the space factor? And then how do we evaluate the field expressions? Sir, one doubt, sir. Yes, please. Sir, can we consider a point source as the infinite infinitesimal uh, small dipole antenna? A point source, is it? Yes, sir. A point source as an infinitesimal dipole antenna. I doubt because in a point source, there is no direction for the current, correct? Correct, sir. But for an infinitesimal dipole antenna, there needs to be a direction for the current. Yes, sir. So I don't think we can consider point source as an infinitesimal dipole antenna. I don't think so. Unless you assign a current, you force the current that okay, the infinitesimal point source has the direction of this current. But as soon as you force the current, it is no longer a point source, correct? Correct, sir. So I don't think so. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other clarifications? Any other doubts? Okay, Other, if there are no clarifications, uh, we will close today's class and uh, we will terminate today's meeting. Just hold on, I will just have something to discuss. <laughs>